Our scripture reading comes from 1 John chapter 4. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us. In this world, we are like Jesus. This morning, we light the fourth Advent candle as a symbol of love. The word love is used constantly in our culture. We love our families. We love coffee. We love movies. But God's love is the ultimate form of love, and Jesus is our ultimate example of love. Now join us in singing, One Candle is Lit. Oh, 
and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, friends, normally this would be the time of the service when I would invite the servers to come up to the front so they could gather the collection. We certainly want to thank all of you who have been continuing to support the church over the past nine months. And friends, we uh, certainly want to encourage you if you've got some gifts that you need to offer the church before the end of the year 2020, <laughs> a crazy year that it's been. Uh, certainly want to encourage you to get those in uh, however necessary. If you need any direction, you can call the church office and we can tell you how you can help us out uh, as we finish out the year. And friends, at this time, we will go ahead and sing the doxology to
excellent, excellent midfielder. Love watching her play midfield. She's one of the favorite players on my daughter's team. But I had to say to her, hey, look, I'm really hoping you can play some goalie today. And she looked at me with these big eyes, and she was like, no, no, I, I don't want to play goalie. And I said to her, look, I know you can do this. Why don't you give it a shot? And so I had to kind of twist her arm a little bit, but finally at the end of the game, uh, I was able to get her to go and play goalie. And I was able to say to her, hey, you've seen how this game's gone. Uh, our team had really been beating the other team pretty badly. And, and I had said to her, they haven't even taken a shot on us yet. Because they hadn't. The other team, God bless them, they had not even taken a shot on our goalies yet. But it was this young lady's turn, and so I sent her in. <laughs> and sure enough, after she'd only been there about two or three minutes, the other team managed to get down on our end, and they managed to get a shot off. And as soon as they took the shot, I could just tell that shot was trouble. It had pace, it had speed, it was heading for the upper corner of the goal, and I just, you know, in that split second, I thought to myself, oh no, I told her the other team wasn't going to shoot on her, and now they're about to score on her. And then, almost like a flash out of nowhere, this young woman who did not want to play goalie, she made this really, really spectacular save. And she made it look easy. She made it look like she played goalie all the time. That was her full-time job. And I remember thinking to myself, wow, <laughs> there's, there's not a lot of times when I'm watching, I mean, I've been coaching soccer long enough, but there's not a lot of times where I see something happen on the field and think, wow, to myself. But when she made that save, I thought, wow, it was pretty spectacular. And after the game, I said to her, see, I told you you could do it. And she said, yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> and, and all of us have probably been in that position at some point in our lives when we were trying to say to somebody else, you can do this, I believe in you. Or maybe someone was saying to us, you can do this, I believe in you. And in the passage we're going to look at today, we're going to find someone saying to somebody else, you can do this. Well, friends, today we are continuing our Advent Sermon series, which has been called Watching for the Birth of the Messiah. And over the past month, we have been watching for reasons to hope. We've been watching for signs of peace. We've been watching for uh, tidings of joy. And today, we're going to be watching for divine love. So, let's take a look at our Advent lectionary passage. It is Luke chapter 1, verses 26 and 38. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son. You are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel. Since I'm a virgin, the angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Now look, friends, I know that you've heard this passage many times before, and I know that as we go through the season of Advent, and as we get closer to Christmas, this is one of the passages that is very familiar to us. Nevertheless, let's just pretend that maybe a few of us aren't that familiar with this passage, and let's point a few things out of this passage. Maybe for some of you that know this passage well, there might be a thing or two I might even point out for you that you weren't aware of. So the beginning of the passage, it tells us that we're in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. Now, of course, 
you don't realize this, but in the book of Luke, we're actually introduced to Elizabeth, who was Mary's relative, might have been her aunt, might have been her cousin. Regardless, Elizabeth was much, much older than Mary. Elizabeth was probably around 60 years old at least. But the angel Gabriel that we're introduced to in this passage had appeared first to Elizabeth to tell her that even though she had been barren her entire life, now she was going to have a child. And of course, that child that Elizabeth was going to have was going to be John the Baptist. And so now, Elizabeth's relative, a very young woman named Mary, she finds out that she is going to give birth to a very special son as well. So, we're told that Mary is in Nazareth. And the significant thing about that is, this wasn't Jerusalem, this was not one of the major cities in Palestine. Nazareth was a pretty insignificant town. And this would have gone against what you might have expected for the Messiah. You might have expected the Messiah to be born in Jerusalem, or certainly in an important city. But to be born in Nazareth, that certainly would have been a surprise. We're told that Mary is a virgin, that she is pledged to a man named Joseph. So you've probably heard people talk about the fact that Mary was Probably, and we don't know this for a fact because the Bible never tells us the ages of Mary or Joseph. But you probably hear people talk about the fact that Mary was probably very young, like maybe as young as her early teens. And Joseph was probably older. Again, we don't know that for a fact. The Bible never tells us that. But what we do know of Hebrew customs 2,000 years ago is that generally, Young women were, uh, were married when they were in their young teens, and usually men kind of had to be older. They had to have established themselves, proven themselves to be worthy of raising a family. And so Mary was probably young. Joseph was probably older, 20s, maybe even his 30s. Regardless, Joseph is a descendant of David, and that's a big deal because David was the greatest king in the history of Israel, and there was an expectation that the Messiah would come through the line of Joseph, or rather David, sorry. <laughs> and we're told that the angel appears and says, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. And Mary, who is a very young woman, she doesn't know what to make of this. She is greatly troubled. And the angel says, hey, Mary, don't worry. Uh, you found favor with God. You're going to give birth to a son, and you're going to call him Jesus. Now, Jesus is uh, a Greek translation of a Hebrew name. Does anybody remember the Hebrew name that Jesus is the Greek translation of? Joshua. So, Jesus, when you change that name to the Old Testament pronunciation, was Joshua. And what's significant about that is the name Joshua, and therefore the name Jesus, they mean the Lord saves. Makes a lot of sense for the Savior, uh, for his name to mean the Lord saves. He'll be great. He'll be called the Son of the Most High. So right here, uh, Gabriel is telling Mary he is going to be the Messiah. Now, that was a really big deal, as if all of this wasn't a really big deal. Uh, for Gabriel to tell Mary he's going to be the Messiah, that's a really big deal. He's going to be on the throne of his father David, again, re referring to the messianic aspect of his identity. But then, Gabriel says to Mary, he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. And what does that mean? Is an earthly king going to reign over people forever? Is an earthly king, is his kingdom never going to end? That isn't true about any earthly king. So Gabriel was telling Mary, there is something that's very special about the son that you're about to have. Now, 
Mary at this point stops to ask the angel a question, and Mary certainly could have said, now explain all the theology here, because I'm not sure I'm tracking with you, but instead Mary asks the incredibly practical question, how is this possible? Because I've never been with a man, so how is that possible? And the angel says, it's going to happen through the power of God, and it will happen through the power of the Holy Spirit. And the angel says, hey, look at Elizabeth. She had never been able to have a child her entire life. Now she's in her 60s, and now she's six months along. So if you need any evidence that God is at work right now, look no farther than your cousin, your aunt, look no farther than your relative, Elizabeth. And Gabriel concludes by saying, no word from God will ever fail. And apparently that was what Mary needed to hear. Because in verse 38, Mary says, Okay, I'm the Lord's servant. May your word to me be, be fulfilled. And then Gabriel leaves. I find this to be an incredibly compelling passage, and I could talk even more about it. I could spend probably the next 45 minutes talking even more about this passage. But we don't have 45 minutes, and so what I'd like to do right now very quickly is I would like for us to focus on the lessons that this passage teaches us about God's love, about divine love. And the first lesson is this. Divine love is always at work. Divine love is always at work. Now, in this passage, we see where God's love is at work in Elizabeth's life and in Mary's life. And friends, I don't need to tell you that God's love is at work throughout this book, from the front cover to the back cover. This is the story of God's love at work in this world. And friends, even today, even as we wrap up what has probably been the toughest year of our lives, even today, God's love is still at work. I would contend that, especially in difficult times like these, God's work is at love. Is God's work, God's love is at work. Got those words backwards. God's love is at work. And we just have to look around and we just have to see where God's love is at work around us. So that is the first lesson we should take from this passage. The second lesson we should take from the passage is this Divine love never fails. Divine love never fails. There again, at the end of verse 37, Gabriel says to Mary, no word from God will ever fail. And by extension, I think we can say that God's love never fails. Those of you who know uh, the love chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 8, you know that Paul talks about love and says, Love is patient, love is kind, doesn't envy, doesn't boast, isn't proud, isn't self-seeking, isn't easily angered, keeps no record of wrongs, doesn't delight in evil, doesn't, uh, but rejoices in the truth, always protects, trusts, hopes, perseveres, and how does it end? Love never fails. Love never fails. Divine love, God's love, never fails. That's what the angel tells Mary in this passage. That's what Paul tells, tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And that's what I hope all of us have found to be true in our lives as well. God's love never fails us. And even in the middle of a pandemic, God's love is going to fail us once again. So that is the second lesson about divine love. The third lesson about divine love we can take from this passage is this. Divine love inspires courage in us. Divine love inspires courage in us. At the start of this passage, this angel appears to this young woman and it tells us in verse 29 that Mary was greatly troubled and the angel tried to say to her, 
You don't have to be afraid, Mary. And then a conversation follows. And by the end of the conversation, Mary says in verse 38, I'm the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. And friends, just as God's love, divine love, inspired courage in Mary, we see that, once again, throughout this book, God's love inspires people to do courageous things. Whether the person's name was Noah, or Abraham, or David, or Daniel, or the list goes on and on and on and on. God's love, divine love, inspires courage in people in this book. And I certainly hope that God's love inspires courage in us as well. And so as we get ready to wrap things up, I just want to ask you a question. I want to ask you, what is God's love calling you to do right now? Friends, I don't know what's going on in your life. I know what's going on in my life, but I don't know what's going on in your life right now. But I do want to challenge you with that question. I'm sure that there are at least a few people out there who need to answer that question. What is God's love calling you to do? And friends, whatever you believe that is, I hope you'll do it. I hope that you will follow the calling that God's love has put on your heart. Well, friends, that is where we're going to wrap things up for this morning. The next time we see you, guess what? The next time we see you, it's going to be Christmas Eve. And we're really looking forward to seeing you on December 24th. And friends, at this time, we're going to go ahead and we're going to prepare to gather around the Lord's table together. Friends, our Advent communion hymn this morning is Silent Night.
gather around the Lord's table together, that we are encouraged to examine our hearts. So let us take the next few moments to do just that in silent reflection. not on earthly things that divide us. Instead, this table is a place where we focus on your divine love that unites us. God, as people participate in this online worship service with us, we ask that you bless each and every one of them. Help them to know that even though we might be physically separated, we are united in the spirit and we are united by your love. As we partake in the bread and the cup together, we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, those of you who are worshiping with us online this morning, you are encouraged to partake of your communion elements at this time.
that God created us as a result of God's divine love for us and that we must go and share that incredible divine love with people here 